Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the SIG auto scaling feature and just general update talk. I know it's a little bit late on a Thursday, but I'm glad everyone's here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Ennis. I am a uh, OSS maintainer of a auto scaling project called Carpenter at AWS and a software engineer there. And this is Manchek Patel, and he's a software engineer over at Google. So I'll just walk through a little bit of an agenda that we're going to do today. Um, we're going to give a little bit of an overview between Cluster Autoscaler and Carpenter, and the point of that being we're going to talk a little bit about some work that we want to do um, between Cluster Autoscaler and Carpenter to gain more alignment across some of our features that we have that look quite similar to each other, as well as some API that would make probably migrating between the two forms of the autoscaling much easier um, for anyone writing application specs. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about project-specific updates, so um, horizontal pod autoscaler updates, carpenter updates, and then cluster autoscaler updates, finally. So just giving a little bit of an overview between the two autoscalers or the two node autoscalers that exist within uh, SIG autoscaling today, um, cluster autoscaler and carpenter, they solve very much the same problem, but in, in, in kind of in a similar way. Um, there are some differences between the way they actually do the implementation under the hood, um, and they do have some difference in terms of the, I guess, the scope of what they manage, but they solve a similar problem, at least for auto-scaling and downscaling. So they provide nodes um, so that all pods can schedule. So if you have a pod scale up and you have pending pods and the cube scheduler marks those pods as, as failed to schedule because they don't schedule on your existing capacity, um, both Cluster Autoscaler and Carpenter will react to that. Um, and they also remove unnecessary nodes to minimize your costs. So we both have features um, that we call different names. Cluster Autoscaler calls it, I believe, downscaling. We call it um, consolidation. But both, both of our systems will remove unnecessary nodes if um, we think that we can minimize the cost of your cluster and we can tear down capacity and those pods can schedule elsewhere. Um, and that basically covers the implementation piece there. There are some major differences. Um, cluster Autoscaler kind of works within the construct of cloud provider-based APIs. So all of your configuration for Cluster Autoscaler will generally sit within the cloud provider, um, typically within node groups. So ASGs, MIGs, um, VMSS, the life cycle of those node groups is fully managed by the cloud provider. So um, if you have a new image that you want to roll out to those node groups, Cluster Autoscaler won't manage that for you. That's the responsibility of the cloud provider. Um, if you need to, like Carpenter specifically has a feature for um, rolling nodes if they're past a certain age. Cluster Autoscaler doesn't manage that side of things. It only handles the autoscaling and downscaling of the existing node groups that you have. And so all the configuration will sit in those node groups in the cloud provider, and then it will just basically increment or decrement the number assigned to that node group um, across the cloud provider APIs, whereas Carpenter uh, picks a slightly different approach. Um, it handles the entire node lifecycle. Like I mentioned, we handle node upgrades effectively. So if you have a new image, new worker army that you're trying to roll out, then the node will roll out with Carpenter um, through a feature we call Drift. Um, and likewise, all of the configuration for Carpenter sits inside of the Kubernetes cluster through custom resource definition or custom resources that are based on custom resource definitions that Carpenter provides. So those are at least the configuration differences um, between the two. Um, there is a slight difference as well in terms of implementation if you're looking at implementing a, car, a cloud provider between the two different types of things. So um, Cluster Autoscaler effectively has pretty much all the information it needs to make decisions. Um, so your node groups, I think traditionally, you'll say, here's the instance type, here's the AZ that's assigned to a node group, and then Cluster Autoscaler takes all that information and is able to make the decision with all of that given to it. Carpenter's approach generally is, here's all of my options. I'm gonna send those options to the cloud provider, and then the cloud provider is going to make the best decision based on those options that it has. Um, and this, this is kind of particularly beneficial for, for spot scenarios um, where spot capacity is not necessarily publicly available, and cloud providers generally have more knowledge about what capacity pools are useful to launch inside of. And so giving that information to the cloud provider that has that information um, helps with provisioning spot capacity that doesn't get reclaimed back immediately after you launch the node. 
And then we get into some smaller differences. So the, the, the first things are kind of ideological and maybe more philosophical in terms of the differences between the two things, and, and they probably will never change. Um, these are the smaller differences, and this is going to kind of dovetail into the conversation that Majek is going to lead in a second around how we can fix some of these things and how we can better align some of these things across the two projects. So very simply, we have different wording, which sounds silly, but when it comes to documentation, I do think it is a little bit confusing. And one thing that he's going to talk about is we're kind of looking to align documentation around some of these conceptual things that are, are very similar across the two projects. And so just we call it, like Carpenter calls it provisioning, Cluster Autoscaler calls it scale up, Carpenter calls it consolidation, Cluster Autoscaler calls it scale down. It sounds silly, but those differences do make, I think, conceptual confusion when it comes to figuring out what means what across the different projects. Um, there's also some things like pod annotations are different. That's annoying if you're trying to move applications from one project to the other. Um, and there's some differences in choices around, I guess what you call actuation, um, when it comes to node drain implementation in particular. Um, we have different taints between the two projects. And all this has kind of developed over time as a result of the two projects kind of developing in isolation. Um, and then likewise, there's, there's slightly different behavior with how the pods get evicted, which is also confusing if you're coming between the two projects. Um, and likely, the divergence will continue to increase if we don't start collaborating on a lot of these things earlier. Um, so with that, I'll let Machek talk a little bit about how that's going to look. Uh, Thanks. Let's see. Okay, those work. Um, so I'm going to use those. So um, as as uh, Jonathan already told us, right, um, the, there is the, there shouldn't be that much difference between running workloads um, on cluster managed by cluster autoscale or, and Carpenter, or at least there shouldn't be that much effort needed to migrate them. Um, ideally, you shouldn't be you shouldn't have to change your pod spec at all. And you shouldn't have to learn any new concepts, like the naming thing we mentioned, or, or any other really differences which, which don't come back to some major changes in behavior. Um, and I, I think we're not there definitely. There are all the minor differences that, that Jonathan listed. But I don't think we're actually that far from that point. Um, the main API uh, that triggers autoscaling is pods, and, and really, the main way of specifying uh, requirements is through pod scheduling constraints, and those are already standardized. So um, I think if we can fix the, the minor differences um, Jonathan described, and if we can obviously avoid adding any new ones, we're actually going to be in a pretty good place, um, especially from the perspective of, of just moving your workloads between clusters. Um, now. There are those more uh, significant differences, and uh, they show up much more on the configuration style, or on the configuration side. How you set up your cluster in the first place is quite different between cluster autoscale and Carpenter, and I don't think we see a way to um, address it. So, as, as Jonathan already mentioned, we started a unification effort. Uh, where our goal is really uh, on the pod level or workload level portability. Uh, however, we're not trying, at least not at this time, to unify the way that um, autoscalers are set up or configured. In particular, we don't have any plan to adopt um, Carpenter Node Pool API in Cluster Autoscaler or, or, or build any other API of that sort that will be shared between the two projects. Um, and the plan we have right now to achieve uh, our goals uh, it's basically start with, with really, it's, it's just basically the list of the minor differences, right? And, and how we're going to address them. So the first step is to build uh, shared documentation describing node autoscaling concepts and use this as an opportunity to unify the naming between cluster autoscale and Carpenter. And also, uh, hopefully, if, if we can put this as a concept at Kubernetes level between any other future implementations of autoscalers. Um, the next step is to unify any pod level API, so mostly annotations, um, like the annotations, I think we had an example on a, a few slides back. Um, we want to basically introduce uh, some new shared replacements for those and, and deprecate the project specific ones, probably uh, still keeping them for backward compatibility. 
And uh, we want to go over um, annotations and, and similar APIs on pod or nodes that uh, exist in one project and uh, make sure uh, or validate if, if, if it's something we want to add to other projects as well, um, or if it's something that actually makes more sense just in one of those projects. Um, a necessary part of this going forward, as, as, as also Jonathan mentioned, is, is going to be a regular communication between the projects. We're already collaborating um, to an extent on, on things like DRA, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, but I think we need more of this and, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, keep going and, and, and really increase our cooperation. And uh, those, those really are the three short-term goals. Uh, I would say all of those are in progress to some extent. None of this is uh, done yet, but, but we have um, kind of some pull requests um, in flight, some uh, general agreement on how to do those. And then we have some future ideas. So um, again, addressing more of the minor differences described, like things like uh, how the drain logic works, uh, maybe something around how we handle disruptions, um, building some new shared APIs maybe. Uh, there is no specific plan right now, but that's, that would be really nice if we can achieve this. And finally, and this is, this is I think, most future-looking goal, uh, would be evaluating if you can take this beyond auto-scaling and start looking into some level of unification on the node management level. Um, but this is, this is uh, more future-looking. Um, and this is all I had on the, uh, all we had on the uh, unification effort. One other shared effort I wanted to quickly uh, mention is DRA of dynamic resource allocation. This is something that uh, has been already talked uh, about in the KubeCon, so I'm not going in this KubeCon, so I'm not going to go into much detail. But the short summary is that DLA is a new API for requesting resources that can support more advanced uh, use cases than existing resource requests. It was first introdu introduced in Alpha in Kubernetes 126, and the original design made it very hard to integrate it with either Cluster Autoscaler uh, or Carpenter. And so there is a new cap that, that is a collaboration between um, SIG nodes, SIG scheduling, SIG autoscaling. Uh, hope I'm not missing anyone, but I very well may be. Uh, and this new cap addresses um, those issues. It has been submitted to 130, and there is implementation work ongoing in Kubernetes 130. And, uh, our goal is to support DRA in Cluster Autoscaler 131. I think there is no uh, specific timeline for Carpenter, but there is interest, right? Yeah, there's definitely definitely interest and a lot of momentum from this KubeCon, so it's definitely something we're evaluating. I think the extended resource problem has traditionally been a fun problem for us to solve would be a good way to say it. So, But there's increasingly more support for that kind of thing, obviously, so we're definitely looking at it really hard. Okay. Do you want to take it now to HPA updates? Yeah, yeah so... Now we're going to go into project updates. Um, we'll quickly cover the HPA project updates, the Carpenter project updates, and the Cluster Autoscaler project updates. Um, so on HPA, um, the container resource metric type uh, is hitting GA in 130, um, which is super exciting. So um, previously, if you were configuring HPA and you were configuring metrics um, to watch on to do scale ups, you previously had to um, deal with the fact that it was basically performing it on a summation of the pod resource requests across all your containers which isn't ideal if you have containers with highly different uh, utilization levels for CPU and memory. And so now you can do it on the container resource um, type, which allows you to basically scale up your, your pods based on the utilization of a single container um, rather than having to do it across the entire pod. Um, so that was, it, or it is currently beta, uh, and it was beta starting in 127, and it will hit GA in 130. So we're super excited about that. For the Carpenter project updates, um, V1 beta 1 graduation, everyone loves this topic. Um, so V1 beta 1, uh, we were really excited to announce V1 beta 1 uh, effectively last KubeCon, KubeCon NA. Um, we introduced V1 beta 1 in November of 2023, and this was kind of the natural progression from our V1 Alpha 5 APIs, which had been around for quite a while, and we'd gone through various iterations of the Alpha APIs, um, and had uh, kind of repositioned our resource naming and just the general API and remove a lot of technical debt and to also align it with a lot of Kubernetes more upstream concepts, um, kind of 
dovetailing into the the acceptance of us to SIG auto scaling back in November as well. So um, we originally had resources that were called provisioner, machine, and node template. We kind of realigned these resources around node pool, node claim, and node class. And these took inspiration from deployment and also from storage concepts. Um, deployment because node pools effectively, if you look at their, their actual manifest spec, um, they have a section called template. And the reason they have a section called template is because node pools templatize something called node claims. And node claims are responsible for basically creating a request for a node resource, um, which is then provisioned by whatever cloud provider you're running with Carpenter. Um, and likewise, node classes allow you to define like a flavor of a node claim that you're wanting to launch. So node classes you describe, and effectively today it is the cloud provider specific API. So node classes allow you to describe what's the image I want, which subnets do I launch in, what's my security groups, um, these kinds of things that are more cloud provider specific and some cloud providers, cloud providers are opinionated about them and others are not. Um, we collapsed a lot of the disruption detail. So there was a lot of, I would say a lot of technical debt around the disruption sections um, that we had in, in Provisioner and V1 Alpha 5. Um, we introduced consolidation, I think, it was quite a while ago now, but we had consolidation and this was mutually exclusive to a concept called emptiness and you couldn't set both at the same time and that was kind of annoying and we generally thought that conceptually consolidation is emptiness. Like consolidation already reasons about empty nodes, it reasons about underutilized nodes, it kind of is a, a superset of the existing like emptiness behavior. And so we collapsed on consolidation into a single thing and now we call it consolidation policy and you can configure the aggressiveness of that consolidation policy or in consolidation in general with this field called consolidate after. Consolidation policy also allows you to, to configure how aggressive you want to be. Um, you can either say consolidate my nodes when they're empty or consolidate my nodes when they're slightly underutilized or underutilized in general because when Carpenter sees your pods can reschedule elsewhere, it will scale you down or launch replacements that are cheaper. Um, and that all fell under this section called disruption, and it was kind of teeing up additional work around disruption controls, which we've done a lot of work over disruption controls in the last six months, and we're also planning on doing a lot more work on disruption controls as we head towards V1 stability. Um, we removed webhooks, which was another big pain point for a lot of users, uh, and replaced it with CEL, and uh, we graduated our drift feature to beta, which means it's enabled by default starting in V033. So yeah, disruption got better with budgets. So in V034, we introduced this concept called disruption budgets, which are effectively node disruption budgets, um, similar to pod disruption budget concepts. Um, you can tell Carpenter how aggressive you want disruption to be. Um, and you can also effectively define maintenance windows on your disruption behavior, which was a heavily asked for thing. Um, so if you just look at the spec here, um, this disruption budget, so disruption budgets effectively define like the most restrictive one is the one that's going to apply. So this budget here says, okay, you can't, you can't deprovision or you can't disrupt nodes during non-working hours. So there's a schedule component, there's a duration component. It says Monday through Friday from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. Don't disrupt my nodes. From Saturday to Sunday, never disrupt my nodes. Uh, and then otherwise, you can set a percentage or a numerical value on the disruption budget. You don't need to have a duration or a schedule attached to it um, to say either disrupt, so if I have over 50 nodes, um, don't disrupt more than five, because again, the most restrictive one applies. If I have under 50 nodes, then consider 10%, because that would obviously be more restrictive under 50. Um, and it's, it's calculating that based off of the number of nodes the node pool manages. So. That was a huge win. What this also allowed us to do was it allowed us, because now disruption is user configurable, how aggressive it is, the parallelism attached to it is user configurable. It meant we could effectively be as aggressive as we wanted to be on the back end, respecting user configured limits prior to the introduction of this feature. We were doing one replacement and on expired nodes and one replacement on drifted nodes at a time. And that was causing a lot of pain for a lot of people who had like thousand node clusters and they wanted them all to roll. And they're like, can you please do more than one at a time? So this allowed us to basically say, you know, if a user wants to do 10, they want to do 100%, you can go and do it. Um, don't do that in production, though. That's not a good idea. Um, so just 
this behavior is kind of interesting, and we definitely need to do look a little bit more into why this behavior is what it is. Um, some of it has to do with our safety mechanisms around how we reschedule pods to make sure that the pods are still schedulable after we do subsequent disruption operations. But effectively what we saw is, you know, you look here, it's like we're doing one at a time, so effectively 1.5 per minute. Um, and if you look now after we basically made a wide open disruption budget, we can do at maximally 20 a minute, which very fast, um, or at least quite a bit faster than it was before. And scheduling got it quite, quite a bit better over the last six months as well. Um, we did a lot of work on our scheduling performance by CPU profiling it. And so if you look at 28, which we're on 35.2 as the latest version right now, so if you look at 28, um, we do scheduling benchmarking on the upstream repo. And so this benchmarking I think now it goes up to 5,000, but at the time it only went up to 3,500, and it made like diverse sets of pods and then scheduled them and saw how long that scheduling took. And at 3,500 pods, we were looking at about 30 seconds back on V028. That got cut way down to about one second on V035.2, which is the latest version. And then on head, we did some more improvements over the last like 20 commits. And so now it's like 10 milliseconds, at least at that that scale for that kind of scheduling simulation. Now, not all those pods are like anti-affinity pods, so there's ways that they could be, that could be more expensive and more complex. But we effectively cut our scheduling down like 300 times, so that's pretty good. Um, and the last one, or I guess maybe the second to last one, um, we improved our cloud provider support, so AWS kind of shepherded on and built Carpenter. Um, so AWS's cloud provider support and kind of it did from the beginning. Um, Azure supported Carpenter starting at last KubeCon. They announced it, I think, right during KubeCon. So Azure has support. Um, we launched Quark provider support, uh, which is uh, Kubernetes without Kubelet. And that, one, that one's more of like a toy cloud provider um, if you're interested in just messing with Carpenter without having to run any capacity. This exists within our repo. It's linked in the slides. Once you get the slides after this is done, you can mess around with Carpenter without having to pay for it, um, except for the capacity that Carpenter runs on. And then Cappy is also working on a Carpenter provider that would enable it to provision Cappy resources, which is kind of a cool concept. So that one's coming soon. That one doesn't exist right now. Um, but there's been a bunch of work in the community and a working group that's happening around that as well. I'm going to quickly run through this. Um, looking forward, what, we're, what are we kind of looking at over the next six to eight months? Um, V1 release is kind of our North Star right now. We're looking towards stability. And so um, we're doing a lot of work to figure out what's on our V1 roadmap and what does the V1 API look like. So um, if you're interested in involved in the community, be on the lookout for RFCs that will describe what we think these things should look like and then obviously give feedback around that. Um, a lot of this will include things like improved observability. We're going to improve our kind of our entire metric story right now, where it's a little bit, I would say, sporadic across the repo and not holistically well-defined. Um, we're gonna do a lot of work there to better define that, improve our observability around status conditions and native Kubernetes objects and eventing and all that. There's gonna be a ton of effort that's put into that. Um, we're talking about doing more realistic benchmarking with the Quark pod provider that I mentioned. So um, we currently do the scheduling benchmarking simulations today, which are useful, but maybe not as accurate in the sense that they don't mock real nodes. Um, so we can go a step for, further and do like live test scheduling simulations. We can also measure our disruption performance through that as well, which we don't quite have benchmarking on that today. And then um, a lot more work on disruption controls. So we're talking about a bunch of different features. Not all of these may make it in, but these were mainly put up there, for example. Um, I think a lot of these will most likely make it in in some form. But Tain on disruption condition, this is one people want so that we stop scheduling, or that cube schedulers stop scheduling pods to nodes that we're gonna take away soon, because um, that's caused different issues with different ways that you can control Carpenter's disruption mechanisms. Um, a concept called disruption grace period, which means that if, for whatever reason, like there's a PDB blocking my disruption, and I, like Carpenter hasn't been able to disrupt this node for way beyond when it was initially like considered for disruption, you can say, actually force, like proceed on, Maybe not force kill it, but like proceed on and, and ignore my 
uh, protections past a certain time frame. Like you have a CVE, you need to patch it. That's kind of an example. Like a day past your exp expiration period, please proceed on. Um, yeah, and then things like forceful, non-graceful termination, which is more of our drain behavior, and support for a feature or support for consolidate after with consolidation policy underutilized, which isn't supported right now, and a lot of people want. So these are all things we're thinking about moving forward. Uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Anshek to talk about CAS updates. Um, thanks. So uh, coming to Cluster Autoscaler, uh, we've been focusing on performance recently and uh, performance in few different dimensions. So um, one simple update is that we've done a lot of work to optimize CPU and memory usage of, of Autoscaler. So between 127 and 129, we've seen more than 30% improvement in, in both, in most clusters we've been testing. And the uh, improvements actually are bigger in larger clusters. So in, in 5K node tests that we run, we've seen more than 2x improvement. This is split between 128 and 129, so probably best to measure between 127. Um, another thing we've done um, is we have enabled by default the parallel drain logic, which we first introduced in 126. This is essentially a complete re-implementation of the scale-down logic we had before. And uh, it makes it both uh, safer and, uh, more importantly, or more significantly faster. Uh, depending on the configuration and the parallelism level you, can, uh, you, you set, it can be many, many times faster. Previously, we, we would only drain one node at a time. So with parallelism of 10, which I think is the default one, you get essentially 10 times faster scale down. Um, and you can play with the settings, see how much it, uh, uh, how, how far you can go in a specific environment. Um, the improvements generally are especially visible in, in clusters where pods use long graceful termina ter termination periods because those make for very long drain. Um, and another effort which we are now working on, uh, we're not quite done, but we've already made some progress, is optimizing scale up by essentially reducing the amount of uh, one controller synchronously waiting for another controller. Uh, let me go into a bit more detail uh, on this one. So, and this is, this is honestly a bit of a simplification, but uh, broadly speaking, if you create a deployment, let's say just one pod deployment for, for simplicity for now, What's going to happen is that Cube Controller Manager is going to create a pod. This, this actually has a few steps, but uh, let's just say it's creation of a pod. Um, then Scheduler is going to observe that pod, mark it as um, unschedulable, and uh, it's only this unschedulable pod that triggers Autoscaler. So only at this point does Autoscaler notice it, and, and basically it goes on and requests more VMs. Those VMs obviously need time to boot up, and finally, when the scheduler notices the nodes are there, it's able to schedule the pod. Uh, now, what we've already done is we have uh, managed to essentially cut out this um, uh, one round trip to scheduler. So Autoscaler can now react to pods before they are marked uh, as unschedulable by the scheduler. Um, and this already provides some benefit in um, uh, latency. Uh, but our our goal, hopefully in 131, we'll see about that. But our, our end state that we'd like to get to is essentially this model. So what we'd like to do is have Autoscaler look directly at deployment job and, and similar controllers, look at replica count, look at pod spec. Essentially, all the information we need is already there. We don't really need to wait for pods to be created. Um, and so, essentially, the logic in Autoscaler and Node Startup can potentially happen in parallel with pod creation and any scheduler action. Um, as I said, this, this one is still uh, being implemented. Um, the motivation for these changes is obviously uh, latency. It's, it's just going to be faster if you don't have to go through so many steps. And some of them can actually be significant in um, large-scale scenarios, so we've seen um, pod queue up in scheduler quite a bit. Um, another thing is it actually also improves the quality of autoscaling decisions. So if you, if you create a thousand pods today, you're going to see essentially cluster autoscaler do multiple smaller scale ups sequentially. This is because as pods are created, autoscaler already triggers small scale ups. So 
for each of those scale ups, it, it only has a very partial vision of what's going on. And so it makes suboptimal decisions. If we are aware of all the pods that are coming, we can actually do the bin packing simulation with all of those pods and use that knowledge to select best um, shape of machine that, that we want to use. Um, Ah, and one thing to mention is the, the change in the skipping the waiting for scheduler is available in 128, uh, 129, but it is opt-in for now. So if you want to, feel free to test it. Maybe not in production day one, but it should be working. And now I have two very small changes that I wanted to quickly mention just because of, um, I think, um, potentially impacting some people. So one thing we've done is we're finally removing Ignortain. This is something I, I've talked uh, actually in the past um, on, cubes on KubeCons. It was a mechanism that caused a lot of confusion. Basically, Ignortain uh, was a way to, or you could mark Taint to be ignored by Autoscaler in scale-up logic, which would um, allow Autoscaler to create new nodes as if the Taint wasn't there. So in simulations, it would know the pods will be able to schedule. Uh, and this really was designed only for the case of um, taints that are used for custom node initialization, like installing um, custom device plugins is, is the usual one. Um, and it was used in many other cases, uh, leading to very difficult to debug issues. So we split this logic into startup taint and start status taint. Startup taint is what ignore taint was before. Status taint is, I think, what a lot of people wanted. Uh, ignore taint to be. So it's just a more general um, any taint that, that should not be taken into account in uh, scale up logic. And um, final small announcement is we are changing the format of our status config map. Um, it's technically a backward incompatible change since, since it used to be just human readable, impossible to pass format, and now it's going to be YAML. And we're also putting more information there, especially about back offs, which uh, have been a challenge to debug in the past, so we hope this is this is going to help. Um, so thank you, and uh, do you have any questions? Hello, thanks for your presentation. It is for you, John. I'm using Carpenter for a lot of months, and uh, actually, we have a, a little problem, or maybe a, a misunderstanding how it works. We have a lot of pods in pending states. Carpenter spin up VMs, pods are uh, start, starting, and a few minutes later, some VMs are killed, and new nodes are creating a little smaller. So, pods are just a pod with our starting are killed and are going to the new VM. Do you know this issue or is this something? Yeah, yeah that's interesting. <laughs> oh, okay. um, so, sorry, just so I understand, you're saying that you have nodes that are launching, pods are trying to schedule to those new nodes, and then we, I assume we, kill those nodes and then restart smaller versions of those nodes? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I'm not, I unfortunately am not familiar with that, so. I, we can talk after, and also, um, if there is a problem there, we should definitely open an issue. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard that, unfortunately, okay. so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. I have a question. Uh, on cluster autoscaler, uh, there is a long issue about uh, scaling down, and cluster autoscaler not consider the balance between multiple availability zones in case the node group spans multiple of them. And if you look at the documentation of all the cloud providers, um, GKE, Microsoft, or Amazon, they all say, yeah, create one node uh, pool per, cloud, per availability zone and use the balanced node groups, but this like complicates stuff, right? So I wanted to understand if this issue is never going to be solved because it's pending since 2020. Uh, and also, I have no idea if Carpenter does better because I don't know Carpenter at all. So I'll take the cluster to scale site and then maybe Jonathan can do the Carpenter. Uh, so we don't, as you mentioned, we don't have um, any mechanism right now for, for balancing between availability zones on, on scale down. We only have the balanced similar node groups, which only 
triggers in scale up. There is no current ongoing effort to fix it, which I don't think means that it's never going to be fixed. Uh, we're definitely open to contributions and uh, um, hopefully at some point we'll just go get uh, to fixing it uh, on, on the site of, of maintainers of cluster autoscale. We're definitely aware of this issue. Yeah, on the, and on the Carpenter side, um, I kind of, I guess I'll answer the, the like, which do I use kind of style of question, I guess, because that's that's a question that I think we, we get a lot generally, and I'll let Machek add any detail if he wants. Um, just kind of like what you said at the beginning, like they each kind of have their different trade-offs in terms of where you want your configuration to live and what you want managing your life cycle. And there's also a difference and it wasn't covered that in terms of like, I mean, it kind of makes sense. There's only four cloud providers within Carpenter, so there's a difference in cloud provider support right now as well. Um, so you have to kind of use all those things to evaluate which, which project is, is right for you. And maybe the answer is both. Um, in terms of Carpenter's handling of like multi-AZ scenarios, you, because all of the configuration exists inside of the cluster and it's not necessarily tied to, like, like I said, we send off all that information to the cloud provider and it makes its decision. And all that configuration is not tied to the cloud provider API. Multi-AZ, uh, it requires one, basically one configuration surface in Carpenter versus having to, to create multiple node groups like you would in, in CAS traditionally. I hope that answers your question, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about the, because now you have two projects that are kind of doing the same thing, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what are like the strongest motivations for not ending up with just one project doing the same thing. <laughs> uh, there's probably some reason. Uh, I, I can start and then we'll see. Uh, I think, I think uh, the major motivation is um, the major difference section we had before. So they do the same job um, and and sort of externally as a user when you run pods, there may not be much difference, but how they work behind the scenes and in particular how they integrate with the cloud provider is, is very different. And so the, I, I think large part of the motivation is um, it may, depending on the underlying APIs and, and behaviors of cloud providers, those are quite different. It may be that one or the other approach just works better. And uh, I think we are far too divergent in, in our code base to be able to just say it's one project with two different ways of, of integrating cloud provider. Yeah, I think maybe one example is if you, um, there's specifics on node upgrade behavior that you like about how your cloud provider handles it. Like it does like a uh, maybe a starting kind of like an exponential rollout where it would start slow and then move forward very quickly. Um, Carpenter doesn't support that kind of thing today. So um, potentially there's differences in how the lifecycle management is handled on the cloud provider side that you might like more and therefore you'd want to use CAS versus Carpenter. And then there's also the detail about like, do you want to manage the, the configuration surface through the, I mean, and that one's more, I guess, minor but do you want to ma manage the configuration surface through the cloud provider or do you want to manage it directly on Kubernetes? Um, yeah. And I think they're so philosophically different at this point that it's, it's really hard to say like, oh, I could merge them because they, they do solve some more problems, but they're, they are like much like I said, they are so like philosophically different around how they actuate everything that it's, it's really hard to say, oh, should we should just converge them. Yeah. Thanks. I, uh, I just learned about the do not disrupt annotations. So good, but I was wondering what the difference in implementation um, between uh, CAS and Carpenter are, especially when it comes to does, if there is the annotation existing there, does it, especially for CAS, does it just not scale because the cloud provider handles that and you can't specify, hey, you can scale, but just not this node. Um, and I assume that there's better support in Carpenter for scaling a different node uh, but if you could elaborate on that, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the question. You mean scaling down nodes or? Right, during the scale down or the consolidation, mm -hmm. um, if there is the do not disrupt annotation or do not evict annotation, what happens uh, in, in CAS? Oh, I see. So I think one, one kind of um, um, misconception or, or one easy assumption to make about CAS is it just changes the replica count of, of the underlying uh, node group, but that's not the case. It, it picks a specific node. So it generally expects the underlying node group 
to have a function that allows reducing size by deleting a specific instance. And so it's always a specific instance that's selected for deletion. That makes so much sense. Thank you. Is it the same for Carpenter? Yes, it, it picks a specific instance. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, there's at least one other uh, outscaling provider uh, or implementation I'm aware of that's uh, Escalator, uh, which I think was published by Atlassian. Um, do you know if there's any integration or if there's any uh, initiative to also have them join uh, the SIG? Uh, I'm not aware of any. We also have SIGLIT here, but it seems like... <laughs> I shook his head no. Yeah, <laughs> that seems like a no, so I think uh, not so much. I think for uh, Carpenter, we were really, as a SIG, approached by Carpenter, right? So. I think that was uh, the um, um, kind of direction it happened last time, but we'll see. Yeah, I think if there was some more effort from their side, we'd obviously evaluate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, hello. I use both projects, and they are great. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I my question is about Carpenter. I can use the disruption, but the disruption annotations to turn down. Uh, non-production uh, environment uh, nodes to turn down the non-production environment. This was what it was mean for, or disruption budget was created for some other reasons. So let me see if I understand. So you're saying you... I want to turn down a non-production environment in non-working hours, for example. Oh, you want to spin down nodes during yeah, non-working hours? Yeah, down. I see. Um, no, do not disrupt was invented for most most often for like jobs for AI ML use cases where you don't want like your job getting disrupted in the middle. Um, obviously, for stateless applications, it matters less. Like, I mean, ideally, you don't want your your stateless application getting disrupted every five minutes, but if it's disrupted every now and then, you should be able to recover. Um, yeah, it was more invented to say, okay, let this thing finish, and then once it finishes, Carpenter can then act on it. Um, it, it's less for like orchestrating the scale down because realistically what Carpenter does today is if there's a scale down during non-working hours of your pods, then Carpenter will just naturally, like with consolidation, will just naturally scale down for you. Like it'll remove the nodes because they're no longer used and, and you'll save money during non-working hours. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. Thank you for all these updates, uh, very nice. One got my attention, the one that you mentioned that is like um, the not disruption budget that you put there. Uh, at Datadog, we are using the cluster autoscaler and we have a dedicated layer to, do, to tear down the node, especially when you want to roll out a new image and so on. We, we proactively um, uh, drain the nodes, let's say. And one of the things that uh, we do is we have a big node pool, so think about thousands of nodes. And the restriction that you have put in this node disruption budget um, that you show applies to the entire node pool. Whereas the constraint that you may have may come from all the app different constraints may come from different applications all running on that same node pool. So you may have different applications coming with different needs in terms of space or uh, you know working on, on different days or this kind of things. And if you have like 10 nodes on top of a thousand that says like, I can be disrupted only on Monday, uh, it's gonna ap be applicable to everyone in your case if the setup is at node pool level. I see, so you're saying a scenario where you might wanna like tweak your pod disruption budgets during certain hours to stop them from being disrupted potentially? Is that kind of the? Yeah, the thing is that multiple applications are running on that node pool. Right. And some may be very restrictive, but represent only 10 nodes on top of a thousand. I see. So you want to say like this application shouldn't shouldn't be yeah. disrupted during this time, yeah, right? but everything else can be. Is that exactly that? this? We tackle this this pro, this kind of problem, and the thing is that we have this setting at application level, not at the, not pool level. I see. You're saying you have it set at the application yeah. level? How do you orchestrate it today? But we have a dedicated controller to do this part. Oh, I see. I out see. of uh, cluster auto scaler. Got it. The cluster auto scaler finally tear down the nodes when they're empty, but all the we are piloting the drain and everything with a dedicated layer. Yeah, I think I think one interesting thing that we talked about when we were considering node disruption budgets was like why do pod disruption budgets not have like a similar kind of semantic? Because I think that would probably solve the case you're talking about to some degree. Yeah, this is what we've created here. I see. Okay, yeah. So, so <laughs> that's just an saying that discussion, I think. Yeah, yeah, we may have it like at the application level, maybe not at node pool level. If right. node pool is shared by multiple applications, that 
you may have fully. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I totally, I think there, I mean, we kind of, I mean, you can tell by the way that Cass and Carpenter think about configuration. There's like, there's the two layers, obviously. So I think mm -hmm. the, the cluster admin node pool layer is important because cluster admins generally need to be able to configure these things to, to protect their application developers to some degree, but the application layer is obviously, and we, we typically see like similar configuration surface at, at both layers because the use cases are very similar. So yeah. I think I think it's worth a discussion. I yeah, completely sure. agree. And uh, yeah, limitations of PDBs are also something we've been talking about forever in cluster autoscaler community. So maybe that's one more thing we can work together on. Okay. I I think we're, at this point, we're like 10, 11 minutes over time. So I, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap up. If anyone has a question, um, you can feel free to come and talk to us afterwards. But thank you.